Josh just laid a pretty cool set of words on me around his conception of the nature of the role of music. Mm -hmm. And I'll just sort of recapitulate it, but also to do a little bit of a harmonization. Please. Um, it, as a, not abstract, but pure, a pure form of relationship with time and with cycles. Mm -hmm. And what was coming up for me as you were saying that, describing it, and, and notice I had to make the distinction between abstraction and pure, because the whole point is that it's not in the least bit abstract. It's completely non-abstract, and yet it's also very particularly hmm, not bound up in anything other than precisely what it is. So it's pure. Yes. Yeah. Um, Should I say what I said before? Just to yeah, like, yeah. If anybody's watching this after the fact, they're clued in. Um, just a few minutes ago, Jordan and I, you know, Jordan's like, well, where do you want to go today? And um, I just shared that I, I've been really exploring this concept of, of music as a, as a path of harmony in that it harmonizes our relationship with ourself and then that can harmonize our relationship with others and specifically how it is a, a play of time and time being cycles frequency so that music is comprised of pitch, of rhythm, all these different plays of time and in an organizational way. So when we begin to organize our perception of time, what we begin to do is expand our present moment and allow ourselves to stay engaged in the present moment for a longer duration. In doing so, obviously having more agency in that experience because you know, the, the state of mindfulness, we're less reactionary when our moment is expanded, expansive. And in doing so, uh, allowing us to have a better harmonious relationship with ourself, our environment, each other. And that's right before we press record. All right, so check this out. I'm gonna, I'm gonna throw hmm, maybe exactly one more thing out there. Yeah. Um, that's really been coming up for me a lot recently. Uh, and then we can go, we can start to riff. And I should mention, by the way, that if anybody you know, follows my stuff, you'll, you'll, you'll know that occasionally I'll use musical metaphors. And when I'm using musical metaphors, most of that actually comes from Josh. So thank you, Josh, for sure. pointing me with the essence of music so I can actually use it. <laughs> okay, <laughs> so um let's see if i can say this right this is relatively new well it's not new for me but it's newly this is a new way of expressing something which hasn't actually been able to be for me expressed in language um so it's something like this it's like for a long time like maybe forever up until recently um coherent phenomena are bound their coherence is produced by virtue of the uh, physical characteristics and the ones that I care about most by the constraints of evolutionary fitness. Okay, so, mm -hmm. you know, I had an experience one time of, of looking at the shape of a leaf and really, really realizing that the shape of that leaf was perfectly the shape of the niche of the leaf. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the ratio of sunlight and wind and the tensile strength of material. I mean, every aspect of that leaf was the sort of the, uh, you, know, you put your, your hand in clay and you pull your hand away and you see the impression of your hand in the clay. Like there, the leaf is not you know, kind of bound. It's super precisely bound by the shape of the space that it is evolving into. Um, but humans, technology, culture, um, begins the process of the subjectivity of that binding, meaning we have the ability to shape our niche. Other things do too, but we have the ability to shape our niche in a way which is highly asymmetric with the, the strength of the niche itself increasingly over time. And so I have this image of something like it's you know, held together like this, almost like from the outside, you know, all mm -hmm. the, all the, the uh, like atmospheric pressure or something is holding something together. Or, or, or gravity, let's use gravity as a metaphor. Like you're going up, up, up in an elevator mm -hmm. and the gravity is holding your feet or the acceleration, I mean, the simulated gravity is holding your feet to the ground. And then the elevator stops. And let's have the elevator be a space elevator so there's no gravitational field. Mm -hmm. Now suddenly you're floating. Nothing is, 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 is grounding you. So the only thing that's grounding you is now 
your choice, your capacity to produce some kind of directionality in the mm-hmm. context. Okay. Mm-hmm. Now to take all of that, I'm saying uh, my proposition is that's where we are as a species that we have hitherto been grounded by the force of gravity of the tight fitness of the objective, the external imposition of the forces of evolutionary fitness on us. Mm-hmm. As we have begin increased our power, we have decoupled ourselves from the evolutionary fitness on us and have coupled ourselves to our own choices, our own basis of choices. Mm-hmm. I mean, simple examples like dentistry. You know, if dentistry just disappeared as a function, a lot of people would actually die. Like a lot of people who are born right now that can only survive because dentistry exists, mm-hmm. would, or they would have real trouble, like a lot more trouble than they have right now. And technology has eliminated that particular constraint on biological survival. And now there's a whole new thing going on where literal survival can only happen in the context of a technological field that's emerged. Mm-hmm. This is just one example, there's many, many. So we're moving towards this period where we're actually no longer, like the, the sphere like this is kind of going into a flat plane that's zero gravity. And that begins the process of moving here like towards some new mode of coherence. How does coherence hang together? No longer bound from the outside, but now holding together by its own interiority. Mm-hmm. Now, music, um, the, the metaphor would be something like sheet music is music held together by the exterior. Right? There's mm-hmm. some kind of exterior, external constraint that forces each note and each tone and each rhythm to be precisely what it is. Mm-hmm. But we well know, in some sense, the essence of music is precisely the opposite. Right? It's music that hangs together, but it hangs together on the basis of something that is coming somehow from itself or from its interiority or from subjectivity or from consciousness or from some other transcendent location that mm-hmm. is not the externally imposed. And the practice, therefore, of music per se may actually be the practice par excellence of how to go about learning how to navigate in this novel milieu where it's not external constraints it's holding us together. It's actually mm-hmm. some new way of finding out how do we come into harmony on the basis of something that is intrinsic to the nature of harmony as opposed mm-hmm. to this external. All right, that's my... Uh, contribution. I love talking with you first off, you know, like <laughs> it, it, it is such a, a pleasurable brain stretch to, to, to follow. And, and, and I mean this in truly the best ways, um, because I feel you're offering so many different layers at, at, at once. Um, yeah, that's, you know, uh, there's a couple of things that, that in reflection, um, one, when I perceive of music, I, I do like to differentiate capital M music versus lower M, lowercase m music. Lowercase m music, it's the stuff we hear. It doesn't, it doesn't really move us. You know, if you took a Bach sonata, like remember those old keyboards that you would press play and it would just start, you know, playing on itself. When, when, when I was a kid, that was such a novelty, you know, it's like, oh, it's playing itself. Um, that's a great example of lowercase m music. It it's the same notes. It's accurately being reproduced. Mm. But I don't know if that's going to change everybody's like it's like it doesn't change the moment as much. It could. It's still the spirit of music versus capital M music. When we have had that experience at a concert, it could be listening to something where something shifts. We we feel we it changes how we feel, it might even change the course of our life. I'm sure we've all had moments. Uh, at least one, where we heard the song at the right moment. It was like a messenger. The lyrics struck us. It was a concert. It was dancing all night. Some experience of participating with the higher realm of music, capital M music, the spirit of music, is can change the course of our individual life. And I would even posit has changed the course and has guided the course of humanity from the beginning of consciousness and if, if we begin to perceive of music as, as, as a higher consciousness that has continued to interact with humanity to the degree that humanity is able to perceive of it, to enhance the consciousness of humanity, to be able to perceive of more and more uh, greater levels of, let's just say, I, 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 uh, the word complication is coming in mind, but um, greater degrees of, of expressions of music. So just kind of like, if you think about just as a, uh, a, a fun little thought, human, pre-verbal humans or pre-verbal whatever our ancestors were in a forest, 
uh, kind of living somewhat tribally, but they're pre-verbal. So it's, you know, it's loosely based society. And somebody's out and finds some food. Well, how do you attract everybody together? So maybe you, you clap your hands or you take a log and, and, and you hit it. Well, you hit it one time, that catches the attention, but that could be a sound in the forest, but it, it, it sparks the attention, but it could be something. Mm -hmm. Two times, now our attention is sparked and we're a little bit more engaged because it's the beginning of a pattern. Three times, that is not arbitrary. The, the chance of that sound being arbitrary in the forest rhythmically is very low. Therefore, it engages our awareness and we say, oh, that's something. So there's something about pattern that begins to do that. Now that brings people together. And this is a little bit of, you know, my own personal take on it. And then as, as humans have gotten together over rhythmic patterns, maybe there's mm, some notes that we share together that brings people together even more. The more, especially at that prehistoric time, the more people were together. I, as just, a I just found myself perceiving your speaking in its pure, hmm. Like I wasn't hearing the meaning of the words. Mm -hmm. I was just hearing the pattern mm -hmm. uh, and it was a very odd experience. So I apologize for interrupting. No, it's okay. So, you know, people at that time uh, being together in, in a small little unit was very important for self-survival for obvious reasons. <clears throat> and then of course, as they were together, well, they started making sounds with each other, developing words, encoding experiences in song. That song was one of the first, if not maybe the first way of documenting history that it carried a, a past moment into the future, which of course helped with survival that increased cognitive ability. The more they were surviving, eventually they discovered other notes, they discovered musical patterns, which are mathematical truths, not just subjective interpretations, but the, it's, it's experiencing math, which is what Pythagoras kind of came up with. As music <clears throat> continued to enrich and bring us together, both as a, as a single, singular person, as a collective, we began to explore greater variations of music, which continue to expand our cognitive abilities. Eventually, I'm, I'm fast forwarding a little bit, but you get into church harmonizations in the, in the medieval times, you know, really strong musical harmonies that were very uh, coherent at, at a basic level. Eventually you get Bach, who kind of is one of the first ones to really take music out into um, greater spheres. We can partially by creating something called the well-tempered octave, which is, oh, I'll save that for later, but another mathematical advance that created more potentiality in music. And as humans evolved, we were able to perceive of greater complexities of music, which I would say has also in tandem continued to evolve our brain and our awareness, always bringing people together. So the level of, let's just say, musicianship at the individual level, the coherence, the harmony of what it takes to play music, which is kinesthetic awareness, auditory awareness, mm -hmm. and a sense of feeling awareness, mm -hmm. as well as a clarity and a focus of our mental capacity. Obviously, if we're drifting in thoughts, what we're playing is going to suffer. So there's a certain level of music as a path of bringing the human together in a very clear, refined, present moment to the degree that they're able to stay there and play with another person from in that place, now something magical happens because now it's two people coming from a, a pure field of awareness, speaking together in this experience of music. The greater the capacity that, that they're able to do that together, that organizes audience. If there are 60 people playing together in really perfect harmony, which is all necessitated on 60 individual harmonies, that's a magical experience and that attracts people that brings people together through we could continue moving on through the evolution of music as as a guide for the evolution of humanity that music continues to get in a sense more and more precise in a way we'll fast forward through from symphony times to right now well now we have electronic music which is very precise and now the, what's going on with electronic music at the frequency level it's not just you know, orchestra music was uh, create was the development of this of the times that you know if you wanted this big sound, you needed to figure out how many violins you need, how many upright basses, how many, and place them in a way in the physical environment that created this very rich field. But depending on the environment, you know, the acoustics would would change everything. Well, with electronic music, now we've moved into this digital realm where 
just with with these two little speakers on your ear with a very refined very precise tempo it is ch also changing consciousness and bringing people together as we see in current festivals so this is a, a huge extrapolation but the guidance of music as an evolutionary path for humanity to bring us into harmony with ourselves with each other and um and expand our level of presence and awareness so what i what i noticed is is um well i noticed several things one was what would you call it the call <laughs> the super complex equivalence of the where as i'm listening to you i'm noticing that if my mind began to drift i'm like wait i'm I'm evidencing the lack of coherence in myself that is being mm. spoken about. How do I find my way into coordination with this? So there's actually playing with one piece. Something sophisticated going on, so it wasn't easy. Yeah. Um, second piece, I noticed a very interesting, what's it feel like? Like when you go upside down, a feeling of, of uh, inversion or dis not disorientation, but like an inverted mm -hmm. orientation between what I might call the banal version of music brings us together mm -hmm. and the transcendent version or something not the exact opposite of banal. And I'll give you an example. Mm -hmm. So let's see if I can bring it out. And I think what I'd like to do here is also to create a lot of space to make very clear the non banal version of that. Mm -hmm. So the banal version would be something like, yeah, sure. You know, I go to a club, everybody's singing, they're kind of all feeling good together. We're all together. Or, yeah, right. If we're all singing the same song, you know, mm -hmm. whatever, we're singing a hymn together, there's a feeling of togetherness. And to me, there's like a, a way of, of, of almost being cynical about that, almost having a, mm, it's like a, not performative uh, by definition, but it's more of the, you sure you could put sugar on your pancakes and they taste good that kind of a thing it's like ah but then i i was noticing something where i was really reflecting first person like, okay i was like experiencing it not as a theoretical hypothetical but remembering from the first person and noticing that like shared appreciation of a given piece of music mm -hmm. whether it's in the moment it's all playing now or in asymmetrically, I'm listening, I, I am a fan of this song, mm -hmm. is shared appreciation. See, that's the thing, right? Hmm, how do I say this again? A different way. You know, if you've got a group of people and they're all listening, all right, how about this? You know the, the, the YouTube video of the kind of the pop-up Ninth Symphony? Mm -hmm. That famous one? All right, and so everybody's kind of gathering around and they're smiling and they're participating. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of difference in that crowd. Mm -hmm. Who knows, right? Yeah. There's a whole bunch of shit they don't agree on. They don't agree on a lot of things. There's a whole bunch of stuff they don't agree on, but they do <laughs> yeah. agree on one thing. They all agree that they appreciate that music. And that, and that, again, God, it's so weird. Like, okay, so what? No, no, not so what. That essence, the essence of the notion of shared appreciation, that's the thing I'm trying to really put like at the very tip of the point there. The fact that anything at all in universe can at all in any way be the subject of shared appreciation is the point. Hmm. Right? I, I would even I, I would even bring in like what's underneath that shared appreciation. Like the appreciation would be, let's say, at the very social human level, right? Like like appreciation. I'm appreciated. There's a feeling to appreciation. Why though? Like, 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 okay, we can go to a movie and appreciate the movie. There's a different feeling watching a movie with a crowd than what, than at least in maybe this is subjective, than what happens with music. And part of what I would say is that it's in, in addition to having the shared appreciation, we are all having the same sensory input in our sensory sensing in a way. Our, our body, our being <clears throat> is a sympathetic vibrational organism. So music is an organization of vibrations and time, time cycles that, that gets a little bit farther out, but that's what it is. So in a sense, 
our perception, our, even our temporal perception, which is very different from person to person, we have different internal tempos. For some people, time might move slow, fast. Mm -hmm. You know, if you go to the New York versus India, it's a very different experience of temporal relationships. But when we're listening to music, our temporal perception is getting tuned to what is happening. So in essence, when people are listening to music at the same time, even in the same room, in addition to the appreciation, literally their, their sense organisms are all vibrating in the same way, creating a energetic synchrony that, that I don't know exactly the extent of, of what that means, but something, it means something. And I think we recognize that. Yeah, yeah, I think we're, I think that's, I think we're kind of saying the same thing, actually. The yeah. thing I'm trying to point at is something like, um, there was something like a unity. There was something like mm -hmm. becoming part of the same thing. That's right. Even like relating to, so actually becoming part of the same thing. Yeah. Yeah, and we notice that. And therefore, then we also have a commonality, like a relationship. We can be, we can be oh, we're different in many ways, but here we are, in fact, actually the same. We're all in harmony with the moment together. Yeah. Versus being in our own worlds. I mean, especially if we could remember concerts before phones and screens and everybody trying to capture the moment, I leaving the moment to capture it <laughs> for a later moment, <laughs> you know, but, but there, but there's an experience of, 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 we are all together in this moment, in this time and space, in a harmony, having this, this shared unity experience. And there's something transcendent about that. Right. Yeah. And banal. <laughs> it's both. Yeah, it's both. Uh, and we can, and, and that's fine. Um, but, yeah. but, but it's not just banal. <laughs> Definitely not. <laughs> okay, so there's, um, you know, in this moment in time, we're, we're in a space. We're, we're in a liminal space. Yeah. Where previous forms of, of agreement are, have broken down. Yeah. So we no longer have any real, or we don't have a toolkit. They can enable us to actually find a way to agree. Like it's not, it's not that we're disagreeing because we're disagreeable. It's literally yeah. because the toolkit that provides us the capacity to agree has broken down. Um, the thing that, that's below that is the mechanism or the process by which we find something which is in alignment. Uh, our, our, our friend Yasuhiko, alignment beyond agreement. Do you know Yasuhiko? No, I don't. So my friend Yasuhiko, <laughs> alignment beyond agreement. Um, and this is what we're, we're talking about is that music is a is a instrumentality mm -hmm. provides us with alignment absent and therefore prior to agreement and mm -hmm. I'm, one might imagine that it's like a well we can go back to the well and we have to say okay we need to now innovate we need to find a way to to, to further this evolution of music that you've been speaking about to constitute a new music muse that is adequate to the moment that we are in Mm -hmm. to provide us with an instrumentality of alignment that can then support a toolkit mm -hmm. that can provision agreement, the level of agreement that we need. Like we didn't agree on everything. We just need to agree on enough to be able to continue to move forward without yeah. fucking everything up. Nice. Yeah. Throw temporality in there. I think there's something really cool to be unlocked in that. You temporality? Hinted time, you hinted at time a few times. Yeah. I and I that. notice, I, hmm, I'm interested. So let's, let's throw it in there. Yeah. Um, before, I just want to comment on the last thing you said, which is that we need a new music. Mm -hmm. You know, in essence, like, it, and I just as you said that, I was like, yeah, what would that be? And I feel like there's always new music coming in. And it feels like it's always coming from the future, pulling us towards something. Mm. When we listen to the most, at least when I listen to what I would say, cutting edge music now, it feels like, Oh, like I've never heard that before. It's from somewhere else. And I, I'd imagine, you know, when jazz first came and had that experience, you know, like there's a from a nonlinear timeline, we could say music also comes from the future to pull us towards a, a future as well. You know, so when I think about new music, well, I think it's always happening. And I also feel like if part of uh, my mission right now to, to teach music as a mindfulness practice is we have begun to associate, especially in the last few generations, music ah, in a very specific frame due to the industrialization and commercialization of it, which I don't, I wouldn't say is a bad thing, but it is a thing. 300 years ago, I, I could only imagine that the general human's experience of music was way different. There wasn't an industry. 
Mm-hmm. There, there was just music, and, and 300 years ago, it was rare that most people even heard very much of it, you know, in, in, a, in a very diverse way. So we, um, I think part of our perception of music has been through this filter of rock star, professional musician, artist, and, you know, all of these types of things. Whereas, I, mean, I do have a guitar with me, that the basics of music hold true. So, for example, these two notes together, experientially, create a sense of balance. That's, that's the function of the ratio of these two notes, the relationship, the harmony. So I wonder if we need a new music or if we need more people experiencing music at the participation level, playing music at that basic level where it's not necessarily about a song or an album or you know uh, the next new thing, but it's about how evenly Can we experience those notes? And bringing music back to its most basic experience rather than something that mm-hmm. means of expression and all of that. So, so the, like the, the solve for an overly complicated age is a rediscovery of most basic yes yeah direct experience yeah yes there's a lot of things that resonate there right um in fact it's interesting i notice in myself that there's a an overwhelmingly large number of things that resonate there hmm Let me see a few things. One is a sense of yearning. Hmm. If I feel that, I imagine a life that feels like the music you just played. Mm-hmm. I imagine a life where every aspect of life is at that level of say, simplicity, of primariness. Mm-hmm. There's a yearning. I notice I yearn for that. That sort of feels super, yes, very right. And also a relaxation, like, oh, okay, there's more to it than that. Ah, and, you know, this this thing we have, this phrase, um, was it first there was a mountain, then there was no mountain, then there was a mountain? Uh Uh-huh. This isn't necessarily, this isn't a call to go back. What happens, I think, is when we relax into that more primary, a vastness is made available yes it is currently held back by the complicatedness that we yes. are burdened by definitely yeah. yeah and to play music like that takes takes finding that within mm-hmm. that's that's part of the magic that I, that i've been discovering in my own path and you know as a teacher it, it's that part of the magic at, with music as a musician in relating the experience to a listener, because it's basically, you know, it's, it's, I, I think about sound that, that we're releasing sound into the world, because that's really what's happening. The sound exists, we're just releasing it, and somebody is receiving it. As a musician, we're doing both at the same time. We are rece- releasing the physical sound, receiving it, and then releasing more sound. And what ends up happening is, there's an internal reception that ends, that that it begins to open, where we're receiving sound from somewhere else that that is before the physical sound, uh, in in yogic terms, anahata, the unstruck sound. Um, the deeper I can connect to that sound, the more I find the listener can connect to it too. There's, there's something about that that that, that it, it brings it to life, and vice versa. When I'm playing. The deeper the listener is connecting, the more it helps me connect to it. So the simplicity of being, I would say, is the the, the clear ex- internal experience of having direct connection with the sound. 
and following it to a depth that's more than just the periphery, oh, those are notes. That within every note, there are technically, or at least you know, theoretically, an infinite amount of, of harmonics or overtones that's produced by it. Now, obviously, we have limited how much we can actually hear by, by our uh, you know, bandwidth of our physicality. But conceptually, there's an infinite amount of little smaller waves drifting off of that, that one fundamental wave. So there's a lot to tune into. And to the degree that we're able to tune into that depth of perception, in a sense where we are tuning into an infinite moment through a temporal experience. So if, if we were to bring back time in, into this into this thing, mm. you good know, time. yeah, good timing, right? You know, I think one of the things, and I, I've been really exploring this concept of time, and it feels uh, in, in the connection with music. Um, one, I think when, when a lot of people think about time, they're thinking about like, Oh, it, it is 335 or, you know, like like co time coordinates, which is what we generally use the clock for. But time is something different than, oh, it's this time, just like an address is something different that an address marks space, just like our clock marks time. But obviously space is infinite and, and time is infinite, but we have a perception of it within various boundaries that we perceive. So anyway thinking about time more as vibration, as cycles, <clears throat> that our experience of time is something that is dynamic, that at least from our perception is always moving forward towards the future, that we, there's a perception of past, there's a perception of, of or at least an anticipation of future. And all of that is always within the present moment that we're, that we are in. We can never be outside of the present moment, but we can direct our attention in the present moment to moments that are not present. <laughs> so thinking about or at least beginning to perceive of time as something that's flowing forward, perhaps also flowing towards us, depends on our perspective of it, but that, that it's dynamic, it's, it's, it's moving. And our, um, you know, I'm not a physicist by any degree, but my, my little, you know, bits of, of understanding of, you know, relativity and and the connection between time and space is that part of it, or at least maybe everything, is has to do with the spin of the Earth. That 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 is creating a, cer a certain um, relationship between the twisting of space, the fabric of space. In short, the the regular cycles of the Earth spinning around itself and the Sun creates consistency. <clears throat> it 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 if the Earth spun 22 hours one day and 27 another day and 33 another day, that would be a very irregular thing and it wouldn't be in orbit and, and life on the planet seem, assumingly wouldn't exist or at least would be drastically different than, than what we are. So in a sense, looking at time as, as cycles or frequency of vibration, the Earth spinning around itself is a cycle, the Earth spinning around the sun is a cycle, a cycle that the subatomic layer, all those spins are cycles. and vibration is cycles. I mean, sound is the cycle of vibration that we are perceiving at the auditory level, as well as kinesthetic level. And that's a little bit of, of part of, I think, the, the function of it. So when we begin to think about time, again, rather than thinking coordinate of time, clock time, more of that time is always flowing forward. And we are always part of that. Now, our perception of time for I would say is not very attuned for, for for most of us. Where does the time go? You know, time flies when we're having fun. You know, time we I, you know, we could think about the three minutes before three when in high school, looking at the clock and how slow it began to tick. Our perception of time changes, and from my study and kind of hypothesis and part of what I'm digging into is that well, it has to do with our brain waves. Just really simple, our neural activity that when they're firing differently, uh, our experience of time changes. And our experience of time is kind of always in flux because our brain waves are, are generally fluctuating to a degree that's outside of our agency. What music begins to do is, is create a regulation of our time sense. So rhythm, for example, is, you know, pulse. The more steady it is, the more equal measure of time it is. The more equal and regular that pulse is, 
something begins to happen. So if we think about a little bit like if we're building a building, we're measuring space. And if we understand the architectural balance, which is actually the same ratios as music, we, that, we can get into that. But if I'm going to build a wall here and a wall here, it's good to know where that middle point is for structural integrity. It's good to know where the middle point between those two points are. The more accurate my ruler is, the more accurate I'll be able to do that. Our time ruler is kind of stretching a lot. So rhythm begins to help us regulate that at the internal level, which I would say creates a time structure in a way. And what is that structure of time? Well, it's the expanded present moment. So I, I said before that we're always in the present moment, but maybe we are drifting off thinking about future things, thinking about past things. We're not present for the present moment, but our attention is only available in the present moment. This sound only exists now. And as the sound continues to move into the future or expanding the present moment, that now just gets you know, a longer duration. It, it's, it's engaged for a longer cycle. So this time structure, rhythm, helps attune our attention to stay present for a longer cycle of time where a present moment meets a next present moment, a future present moment with equal measure. The more balanced and regular that is, the more the, that temporal structure begins to establish itself and something magical happens. And I think part of that is that it is extant, expanding our temporal awareness away from a very small segment of time that we're that we're experiencing moment, 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 moment. When that's happening, we are dysregulated. The faster that is, the, the more compressed that moment is, the more we're going to feel anxious, intense, like waiting if we're in a rush and we're waiting in line at, at the checkout. Two minutes feels like it's 20 mm. because our moment is very compressed. So our subjective experience of time is different. But by being able to develop the ability to hold a a spatial temporal structure for a longer time, it begins to expand our present moment. In doing so, we begin to feel more relaxed, more at ease, more in the flow. And we are able to meet a future present moment with regularity. That in, and with music, I, I know you have a ton to say, and I sort of like it seems, <laughs> with music that happens at the more micro level where it's like, this moment, this moment, this moment, this moment, new measure. But how can that also expand into a longer, greater macro time? So if we are more aware of the micro moments, which would be, you know, roughly around anything less than a second or more or less than two seconds, you know, a little span of, of moments, the more we begin to tune our time sense at that micro level, the more we realize and develop the ability to tune our time sense at the macro level, every day can become a beat. We can begin to get traction in our life because we're making choices in the present moment to meet a future present moment. And we're able to meet it with regularity. That creates a rhythm of flow, just like it does with music, but at a more micro or more macro level that um, at least I found in my life it can create a lot of success. <laughs> success. Well, the term that came up for me was this term continuity. Yeah. Um, oof. Jesus Marimba. Uh, let's see. Uh, synesthesia is a tricky business when I'm talking with you, man. Um, let's see. So I had I had had an had an image of I think the the interior dome of a mosque. Mm. A very complex geometry. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then this notion of continuity. And then, and then the, uh, the concept of, of resonance mm -hmm. and okay. So let's see. Hmm. Ah, uh -uh. okay. And then natural cycles or something like, as you said, uh, you said this, the, the, the structure, the function of those two notes was balance mm -hmm. the proposition that we are sitting in or supported by an actual reality that has a structure to it. Mm -hmm. And we can work with that. <laughs> right. It's kind of a nice thing to know, right? Hey, wait, reality has a structure to it and we can work with that. And by virtue of working with it, good things can happen. Like it's real yes. nice. If you would try to play music, if you don't understand how those notes work, 
eh, it's gonna be rough. If you get it, suddenly it gets easier to create more beauty, which gets easier to create more beauty and it continues to expand. Yeah. So let's see, if I can combine these things together into the kind of the amalgam, mm, continuity, mm, mm, mosque, structure, resonance. Okay, resonance. Resonance speaks to the notion of the degree to which we construct something that's characteristics are in alignment with the natural structure of reality so that the thing that is flowing flows through effortlessly. Yes. Right? So if I have an antenna and that antenna is attuned to the same frequency as the signal is being broadcast, suddenly the signal to noise ratio spikes close to one. Right? If it's slightly out of a tune, if it's out of resonance, the signal to noise ratio quickly collapses close to zero. This is a very specific narrow band of the degree to which our, hmm, our instrumentality, our, our form of embodied beingness is in attunement with the natural structure that allows a certain kind of thing to go from impossible to kind of guaranteed or super easy. Okay, two, the moment, the present moment. The ability to to notice that there's a constellation like that like the like the the dome in the in the mosque of an arrangement of relationship very complex in time or the nature of time the natural structure of time that mm -hmm. the natural structure of time you know all the aspects you said the spinning of the earth the orbit of the earth, the movement of the stars, the turning of the seasons, menstrual flows, like breathing in and out, like all of these characteristics that are happening. And there's a natural structure that's happening. And there's a way to be able to be attuned to that natural structure and begin to come into harmony with that, which yes. begins to allow a continuity, right? This is an expansion of the moment, expands, 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 expands. And in principle, if one can find the right way of connecting with it all the way, complete continuity oneness in the mystical sense yes um and i don't mean hand wavy i mean super not hand wavy i mean for real <laughs> <laughs> ah uh-huh and affordant to the thing that humanity is most needing now yes quite practical very practical So funny, isn't it? Like I, that flip between the banal and the profound of saying, hey, you need to learn how to play music. <laughs> it was like, it, no, no. And I feel like one of those crazy guys, like, uh, you know, the classic crazy guy. Like, no, you got to listen, man. We got to learn how to play music. And you like grow my beard longer, get my eyes even crazier than they already are. <laughs> no, you don't get it. There's something going on here. There's a Pythagoras, All right? Cool, Pythagoras. You know, when you mentioned Pythagoras, what I felt was, was this crazy feeling of like um, two sheets of paper or a sheet of paper being folded in half. Okay. And on, on one side was math and the other mm -hmm. side was music. Mm -hmm. And I folded it in half and I was like, oh shit, they're perfectly corresponding. Mm -hmm. And not like a little bit, but completely. They are in fact exactly the same thing. Yes. Like, oh. And then beginning to see, okay, and, you know, physicality, geometry, which of course is a subset of math, or we could say math and music are, ah, my, are my head's getting a little bit. But the point is, there's something going on. There's a nature yeah. of natural structure that is not bound to a particular medium, a particular mechanism. It's mechanism independent, natural structure. And we can discover that. And then we can begin to orient our, our choices on the basis of that. And yes. say, as a fundamental principle, always flow with the natural structure. It's a good principle. A good yeah. Principle. Yeah. It brings to mind, you know, like uh, part of the part of the beginning of this part of my journey, you know, really like diving in deep into the mysticism and the metaphysics of music and sound and all of this was my introduction to Gurdjieff in the fourth way. And, and one of the um, the things that really resonated deeply just from the beginning, <clears throat> when I first heard his name, I remember, wait, who, you know, and it's an interesting story, even how I how I got introduced to him. But um when I when I first peeked into Gurdjieff, he talked about this concept of, of, of objective art versus subjective art. 
Mm. And I was like, what's that? You know, what's that about? And like sacred geometry, for example, it, the, the, a, a, a triangle within a circle is objective. It isn't expressing an experience. It could You could associate it with an experience, but that symmetry, that, that equilateral triangle, how it divides the circle by three equal spaces is objective and there's some experience of balance by looking at it because mm -hmm. it is a it's a um at least a circle and a triangle two-dimensional expression of a singular cycle divided by three in music that would be a triplet that 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 that's a cycle that 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 divided by three or expressed in pitch a perfect fifth with that, that the the relationship of this vibration to this vibration, that this note here is vibrating three times as fast as this one, or technically it's a three to two, but you could also think of it as a three to one. So basically that is the auditory representation of a circle with a triangle in it. You know, pause there, pause there, yeah. right? Key point, that can be said, right? Really want to hammer that home that we can actually say, and then not just like make up words, but it's really a true statement yeah. that visual circle triangle and auditory acoustic perfect fifth is, right? That's an insanely powerful realization. Mm -hmm. And, you know, maybe it may many people may have that as access to that. Mm -hmm. so you have access to that, to recognize there's a way to navigate reality that takes advantage of the fact that there is something that is real yes expresses itself in the visual form as circle triangle yes expresses itself in the acoustic form as perfect fifth yes. but it is neither right that's a big deal it's very important to have access to that otherwise you're going to have real trouble that's right and i think that that that's at least you know what was the seed of that little bit is that there is objectivity available <laughs> that's that's a nice even better that's a real like okay great there is objectivity available that's a nice thing to have okay cool that simplifies things a lot yes and so and to understand i mean i think you know both you and i have done our own deep dives into uh perception and sight in our inner psyche and inner world and in understanding we have reality filters we there that we we do interface with a level of subjectivity a lot and sub subjectivity is very malleable and also very, uh, very highly able to be influenced, mm -hmm. you know, and and if, if one doesn't have the internal awareness of the difference between the two, mm -hmm. it's easy to assume subjectivity as objectivity. Mm -hmm. And we get into dangerous waters like our current situation or in kind of humanity's always current dangerous situation is that is that thing and part of music is it mitigates that because obviously we can have a subjective experience of do i like this do i not like this does that artist move me what does it make me think of what does it make me feel those are all subjective experiences but at the vibrational basic simple level as we touched on before these two notes are and there's there's just it's just a, a state of truth and they're different than these two notes now, I may prefer one or the other. One may be, you know, my perception may, might not even be in tune enough to perceive the difference, which could happen. But that doesn't mean it's not objective. It just means the subjective perceptual organism hasn't been tuned to the degree to perceive of the objectivity at that point. So again, music at that point, it just at its basic simple level can bring our internal experience to at least a little glimpse of something objective, which may help create an anchor in our current, in our current current of um, of two divisional, at least two, probably more like seven point five billion division, you know, versions of reality. Yep. But at least in America, a, a very obvious polarization, both thinking they're one hundred percent correct and the other is one hundred percent crazy or whatever. Dangerously crazy, I think it's, it's continuing to move in that direction. Yes, you know, and, and how do we how do we work with that? Because that's obviously not sustainable. Well, rather than trying to convince one side 
of the other. Well, what if we're able, what if we just develop a little deeper listening ability to something that is objective and is true, that is transcendent or beyond or not part of any narrative at all, right. and just direct experience? What does harmony feel like? Because harmony does have a feeling. Balance has a feeling. What nice, does, nice. Yes. Okay. Cool. I've, over the past five years, I've found many people have said to me something like, "We need a new narrative." Mm -hmm. and I've always been no. That is not right. Super not right. Like absolutely wrong. Uh, any effort to create a new narrative just makes more trouble. Yes. We need a new harmony. Yes. We need a new harmony. We need the people. I think we need the ability to recognize the importance of harmony and the ability to discern it. I feel like m many of us are attuned to the experience of dissonance, assuming that's harmony. Mm, so and you. Good. And there could be a harmony of dissonance for, you know, for example, if I am complaining about everything, I'm probably going to find someone else who's complaining about everything and we'll complain about everything together. I would say, you know, at least in my own journey, I have found my life has improved the less I've complained internally and externally. And the more I've found appreciation rather than everything sucks. Hmm. But you can find other people who, who agree and find coherence with that and feel harmony with another person, you know? But if we're really in tune with, some, with, with a deeper level, my sense is we can get, we could assume that that new established dissonance feels harmonious. You know, just, a, just, just another quick example, like, because you could look at it, an army, our army is very harmonious. They're functioning very well together and they could go and destroy a lot of things. So it, it's, you know, when we start getting into harmony and dissonance, there is a little bit of unpacking necessary. Nice. That harmony just, it doesn't necessarily mean good and distance, and distance doesn't mean bad, but I suppose it's, it, dissonance and harmony are both um, words of balance or lack of balance in relationship. So then it's about what are we having a relationship with? And just to kind of, you know, cycle back, I don't know if we need it. I mean, maybe we do need a new harmony, but at the, at the beginning, we need to actually learn how to experience harmony as a thing. And yeah, we can, we can say it more, more specifically, it's yeah. continuity, mm -hmm. which is to say we need to have a higher capacity to perceive the harmony that is. Yes. And then allow ourselves to be guided by that in our choices. Yes. So that we reconnect with that progression that you mentioned earlier, which is a call and then an increase to perceive and then another call, right? And that, that sort of indwelling movement. Yes. I was, the other thing I was hearing or seeing was um, like a return to that primordial story of the... So I'm hearing this cacophony of the forest. Mm -hmm. If I haven't learned yet to, to discern the sound of the cacophony of the forest and really begin to actually hold that cacophony as almost a form of silence against the background mm -hmm. of can't hear that right because in some arbitrary sense there's just a lot of noise like forests are noisy there's all stuff kinds of stuff going on and yet there's some capacity that was developed in the ear that gave it the ability to be able to pull that particular pattern mm -hmm. that out of the background noise and bring it into the foreground noise. that's the thing yes now we live in a new a new noise right where the industry has taken advantage of the recognition of that and has learned how to turn that into a new noise. And now our, our systems are all jacked up. We can't, we can't perceive the harmony. And so we need yeah. to learn, relearn a new way, relearn a new way. Hmm, I like that. Relearn a new way to communicate a call that can be perceived in the noise and is aligned with or is, is connected with the harmony that is. Right. So those are the two moves. Those are two very different moves. As you say, mm -hmm. if I if I create a new narrative, if I create a new signal by itself, a harmony d disconnected from the greatest harmony, mm -hmm. then I am actually also creating a separate dissonance. So mm -hmm. guaranteed, in fact, a bigger one ultimately. Mm -hmm. But if I'm doing both, right? If I'm if I'm saying no, I'm grounding myself in the harmony that is, which is that the note that is not yet struck or the note that is not struck. Mm -hmm. And then I'm learning how to skillfully express that in a way that can be heard mm -hmm. above the din of the noise so that attention is called to and trained in how to become more capable of making that connection. Then the moment begins to grow. Yes. Then there's a progressive exploration of that natural, that objective art 
And this creates a container that supports a growing of the subjective art, right? Those are perfect relationship with each other. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And all of that, I would say, is music. <laughs> you know, it's, it's capital M music. And that is music. Right on. And, and that's the, 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 the necessity for us right now to, I think, have a musical experience at, at the perceptual level at the, you know, rather than just passive, rather than listening, although I wouldn't undermine that either, that that is important. But there's something that happens at the participatory level of music, especially using mindfulness as the framework that brings us to that place. And helps us discern like when you said there's so much noise right now and, and it's so true and, and it's increasing it's like man it's the first time in history everybody's talking out loud to each other you know like in a way you know like like every little tweet every little post those are externalizations yeah and um very few minds are that quiet so what we have is an amplification of of, of a lot of loud minds you know and and a lot of pain so how do we how do we get back to the the signal of harmony? Well, one, go into that forest. <laughs> Let's retune to some organic, natural sounds that that are not just that are not just thoughts externalized to begin with. You know, there's so many thoughts externalized. You know, you walk around, you see a billboard, <clears throat> you're watching, you know, people listening right now. These are thoughts externalized. But there's some architecture is thoughts externalized. Yeah, but specifically verbal thoughts, which is the the structure of narrative at the at that level of identification uh, of the mind that, that is stuck in identification, you know, what Gurdjieff called the formatory apparatus. But um, basically, how we need something to retune into silence, to retune into an, an inner stillness that is a reprieve from all that noise, because all of that noise spins our brain around. And, it, and basically, it, our, I think our, our minds are very clogged with, with the hyper influx of information and, and external thoughts. You know, we've never been able to listen to a thousand people share their thoughts within 10 minutes. But if you scroll down Twitter with a steady thumb, how many different people's thoughts are you ingesting in your brain? Yeah. It, it, it's taking a, it's having a toll. So yeah. the, again, so attuning to sound, musical tones, it's a very direct way to clear that internal space from all that and give a reprieve. And I think that's why we're seeing this, you know, the, um, the sound baths and, and, and the idea of sound healing take more and more form because we need it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was, I was noticing if I, if I kind of experienced the notion of scrolling down the Twitter and the mind. Yeah. In our bodies, right? our bodies have a whole bunch of different things that happen at different time scales. Right? Yes, you're, you're reading one mind, experiencing one mind, expressing something, and your body is now responding. Okay, I'm responding to that. What's up? But then you flip to the next one before you've even begun to truly metabolize or process the one mm. that. So now you create another wave of response before the first one's played out. Now you got to the third. Now you're on the fiftieth, and you still haven't finished the first. Right? Talk about a mm. lack of spaciousness for 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 sound, of course it's dissonant. Yeah. yeah. Of course it's dissonant. It's kind of very simple. Yes, yes, right, dissonant. It is clouding our own ability or, or others' ability, I mean, I'll speak for myself, to have to be connected to their own thoughts. Yes. Because there's so much undigested other thoughts in there that it, 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 it's too much noise. So how can we yeah. hear our own intuition and our own truth? In doing so, it's very easy, again, to fall into narrative because we're losing connection to a, a, a sense of clarity from the inside out. Right. And this goes back to that notion of like the form, the sheet music versus playing music. Mm -hmm. Narrative is sheet music. And we can use it to structure ourselves to provide a simulation of music reliably in a context where we can't actually navigate the environment that we're in. So as you say, we revert back to narrative. Like, oh, I, my own thoughts are just, I can't even, I can't even know what I'm thinking. <laughs> the devil comes up, he's like, I got something for you. Here you go. Yeah, although I, I don't know if I would f fully agree with that with that statement, though, of it being a narrative. To, uh, sheet music is more of a roadmap. But but maybe maybe I just uh, maybe I don't fully understand like how you're using that term. But you know, sheet music is a is a system of representation, an abstract system, uh, and outdated in my opinion <laughs> as well um, uh, of, of 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 music. So I guess if you were I, I don't know if it's a narrative. I, I don't know, but, but but I don't know if it's worth 
unpacking that even. It's not as strong as narrative in, in the nature of what it is. Um, it's, it's the same in, in a particular sense, which is that mm -hmm. it, it constrains the shape of the music as an originary act coming from a place that is not your subjectivity. Mm -hmm. Okay, yes. You're, you're an expressor of something that is not coming from your own authentic connection. Now, of course, you can connect, play it. And narrative definitely separates that. Mm -hmm. The difference between, say, narrative and poetry. If I repeat a poem, there's something about where I am actually connecting with the thing that is speaking the poem, not allowing the poem to speak itself through me. Whereas when I pre repeat a narrative, I'm in some sense being separated precisely from the logos, to use that as mm -hmm. a metaphor. Okay. So something there. Simplicity, attunement, like a relearning of attunement at a very basic level. This notion of mechanism independent. Right, that the thing acoustic, the mm -hmm. version of music that is sound, mm -hmm. provides a very particular test harness or training competence in attunement in mm -hmm. general. And then we have the second, which is the, uh, the recognition of the calling to awareness of the precisely the mechanism independence of it. And that movement of here's the sound. And by the way, here's a triangle with a circle in it. Guess what? And there's two moves. The first move is, can you be attuned to this? Can you really feel what's happening here and notice what it is in its specificity. Okay, now, do you, are, you, are you able to make that leap? Because now the universe just got a lot bigger. Mm -hmm. There's natural structure, right? These are now pointed to, to the reality, the embodied experience reality. There is natural structure and the experience capacity to begin to play with natural structure. Mm -hmm. Not a narrative formation saying, hey, there's a natural, natural structure, follow me. But a competence in playing with it and learning how to say it. Or how to how to how to use it, how to ride it. Actually, in many ways, it's like riding a wave. You know, if you're trying to catch a wave, if you're behind the wave or in front of the wave, you're not going to catch the wave. Right? It has a natural structure. There's a pocket. If you hit the pocket, you ride the wave. If you don't, you don't. Mm -hmm. um, so you can actually ride reality by virtue of having a skillful awareness of natural structure and a competence in navigating by means of and through that. And then we, we went all the way back to the beginning. It's this notion of what I call shared appreciation. You called into a higher tone, but this notion of, of actually continuity. Mm -hmm. as, as we do this in a way that together, and particularly supporting each other and doing it together, there's something about that that is a real first person experience of communion. Yes, right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, and, uh, and as you say, continuity, when I, when I teach more about this in workshops and things like that, one of the things I, I bring up is, I mean, music is a continuum that if you imagine a keyboard that goes infinitely in both directions, mm. you know, I, like technically there would be never a lowest note. By the way, lowest, we really should say slowest because that's accurately what's happening. Mm -hmm. That the, the, what we call low is actually going slower what we call high is actually going faster. Mm. But those both directions would, would expand infinitely from the infinite slow or bigger waves to the infinite fast and smaller waves. So literally, it is a continuum of infinite time and space that there is a scalar structure to it that, that's based on mathematics that repeats at scale. But by participating in the scalar structure in one octave, let's just say, octave both metaphorically and, and even literally, we are connecting into a greater structure that that is continuous. So, right. Yes. Yes. Nice. So, so it's, it's 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 a beautiful way to say, hey, there is continuity, and it's not just. I, I don't just have to like say there is continuity. Check it out. There's a whole structure to continuity. We can actually begin to notice how continuity works and shows up, and you can play with it and learn how to you know, all kinds of cool characteristics that make things doable. It's a yeah, hmm. and, and, and in noticing that, it's we recognize our own discontinuity, which is the barrier from noticing the continuity. If my thoughts are drifting, while if, if I'm playing music and my thoughts are drifting, the music dies, because I am losing my continuity, my connection to the continuum of the present moment. Yes. So it's our perception that's all jagged and disrupted, and the longer we could begin to expand it now we're experiencing greater durations of that continuous of that communion in the moment with the infinite 
And in doing so, our reality seems to shift to some degree. When we recognize that we're part of a greater harmony, it's when we're so segmented internally, externally, that we feel dissonance, you know, disconnection, DI being the, uh, you know, the, the Latin word of separation, you know, or even die, you know, disconnection. It's like division. And, and when that happens, we don't feel so good. And when we don't feel so good, we act from that place. So mm. the necessity to have a more a larger experience of, of continuum of continuous experience somehow is a direct experience to our feeling good because we begin to feel part of something again, you know, and, and that and we act from that place. Yeah. So in the past um, month or so, <laughs> this is so fun, bizarrely enough, or maybe not bizarrely enough. I don't, I don't really know how these things work, but this notion of NFTs mm. provoked me into thinking about that question. And my intuitions were like, yeah, there's something serious going on here. It's not superficial. And almost everybody is presu presuming that it's superficial. So I'm going to think about it. Mm -hmm. And on that journey, one of the things that came to me was a deeper investigation of this notion of egregores. Of what? Egregore. Okay. Yeah, this is going to be good. You're going to like this. For sure. Um, I like it all. <laughs> um so so i don't know if i've actually said this out loud i may have uh, thought about it or maybe said it like in small groups but my current thinking on the notion of egregore is that um in many ways it's another word for like demon or angel okay. or supernatural being okay um in the contemporary environment it tends to be a way of saying that that doesn't oppose supernatural right so it's like standing waving culture for example but now that we're talking about natural structure and the object of art, things get more interesting. So, um, so there's a, a particular essay called Meditations on Moloch that combines these two stories, right? Moloch, the name of a Canaanite demon, mm -hmm. child sacrifice in that milieu, or at least the Hebrews refer to it in that fashion. Um, and then the, the, the characteristic of things like a tragedies of the commons or the prisoner's dilemma or exactly what you're talking about, the down, downward spiral of disconnection, mm -hmm. right? Um, a particular kind of disconnection. Okay, so then what I, what I was thinking was saying, okay, if I think about it through the lens of standing waves in culture, culture is always the consequence of the embodiment of a certain kind of, I mean, I'm gonna say technology, but I mean this very broadly. Mm -hmm. and some, novel novel aspect of reality brought into reality by means of human creativity mm -hmm. culture so i have some technology some medium some thing that humans brought into into reality and that changes the affordances the possibilities and the probabilities of, of choice so it's a very simple example mm -hmm. if i don't have literacy at all then i definitely don't have um Oh, sorry, if I don't have writing, then the notion of literacy doesn't make any sense at all. Mm -hmm. I have to have writing as a thing before literacy emerges as an affordance. Mm -hmm. And when I go from, from only a small number of people are reading and writing because it's very difficult and expensive to mass produce books, the affordance of literacy expands enormously across the social field. And therefore, the consequences of literacy, which are not mean, significantly not zero, right? The consequences of literacy also presents themselves much more across the social field, okay? What I wanna say is that is egregore. That is something like demon or angel or supernatural being, right? There is a, a standing wave or some sort of, sort of real causal structure in culture and, and therefore also other way in human behavior that mm -hmm. is constrained by this particular set of affordances and possibilities and probabilities. And these make it play a major role in the, in, in the lives we live, in the, in the nature of our cultures and in the actual evolution and history of culture. Um, at least as important as you know, great leaders and individuals and possibly vastly more so. So then we have a couple of these egregores that have nice clean names that are pretty easy to point out. I'll go with mammon as one that I've spent a lot of time thinking about. And so money, mammon, M-A-M-M-O-N, money changes the affordance of relationships in mm -hmm. lots of different ways, mm -hmm. at least three. Uh, one is hoarding, to hoard, 
is vastly more possible with money. It's almost the nature of money is it doesn't die, it doesn't degrade. Mm -hmm. so it's kind of okay. You can kind of hoard wheat. You really can't hoard fish. Mm -hmm. You can hoard gold like crazy. Right. So suddenly this characteristic, this behavior of hoarding goes through the roof when money shows up, particularly when money finds something like gold. Mm -hmm. That also gives rise to the notion of greed. And if you can't hoard, then having too much is sort of naturally inhibited. But if you can hoard, and if, by the way, and by virtue of hoarding, you begin to notice all the new sorts of powers that are nearer to what is hoarded successfully, then greed begins to increase in the social field. Mm -hmm. if, I, if, I, if I am greedy, then I will accumulate more, then I will hoard more, and all of these benefits of hoarding will begin to accrue to me. Mm -hmm. And by the way, not to others. And there's another one that's probably the most subtle which is the way that money um, attaches agency to itself, right? So I, uh, you know, I, didn't, I didn't make this phone. My agency vis-a-vis -vis this phone is effectively zero, but I bought the phone. I used money to cause reality to be shaped according to my will in some non-zero way. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, the more money I have, the more that's real. Right, the more I can just say, do this, right? I want, right. I want to go to the Mars. Right. Zoop, we're on to Mars, right? Yeah. Agency. But it's not my agency as much as it's my agency inside the power suit of mammon. So I feel like I am an agent and I am, but I'm also in service to the egregore of mammon because mm -hmm. I'm using mammon's medium money to further my will, which means first and foremost, I have to bow at the altar of mammon. Otherwise, my powers go away. Mm -hmm. So I get this magical superpower. I can make shit happen by means of money. But first I have to bow at the altar of mammon, which mm -hmm. means I'm intrinsically furthering the presencing of mammon in the culture. And I would further, I would then name Moloch. And this is a little bit less clean, but I think it's going to be right. I would name Moloch to be the, the proper name of the egregore of institution. Hmm. And any kind of formal relationship that intermediates what I would call natural or real relationship. Right? Mm -hmm. So whether or not it's mediated by money, which is one way, Mammon and, and Moloch go hand in hand quite often, or mediated by some sort of other thing. Like if I have a, a boss at work, in principle, our relationship isn't strictly mediated by money. It's also mediated by all kinds of other things, like I could be fired or just mm -hmm. formal authority. But that notion of the insinuation of formality, formalness, which is not bodied, right? It's not mm -hmm. part of embodied nature or something else. It's human. In between real relationship, I'm going to say that is Moloch. Right? So institutional in general, the notion of institution at all in, in any way mm -hmm. is Moloch. That's okay. my proposition. Um, and this is why I think, and, and, and I can say, I, I, I say that building the scaffolding of, of what happens with things like tainter curves and um, and how and why um, prisoners dilemmas and tragedies of the commons show up right? there's an entropic mm -hmm. characteristic embedded in all institutional forms that will always go through a degrading cycle and a, cas a, a defection cascade so there's something about that that is why i say those things now what i will say is a number of things one if we take a look at it our our culture like our meta culture 10,000 years or so has been seriously dominated by these two guys and others, but surely them, right? Money and, and institutions have played a dominant role across every civilization for 10,000 years. Mm -hmm. Dominant role. Money in some form, institutions in some form. There are others, for sure there are others. Mm -hmm. Those are two that we should be aware of. Second thing, if you're going to go into, I'll say war, but if you're, if you're going to be dealing with egregores, right? if you're going to be dealing with gigantic, huge demons, you better come with some allies. Right? You, either, you either need like a magic sword or you know, an angel on your shoulder or something like that. And so as I've been wondering about that, it's like, a, who is it? Now, a couple of weeks ago was Nickel Moss. So I'm like, okay, Archangel Michael's a pretty good, pretty good choice. You know, Archangel Michael is a, as a story is the egregore that represents precisely the capacity of continuity to impose itself against the disconnectedness that is at the essence of all of these demonic egregores. Right? So I'm blending some stuff here. You just mentioned disconnectedness, right? Mm -hmm. And I would say that the behind or like the deep one, what I would call the adversary as an egregore 
of which Moloch and Mammon are both subclasses, is this is disconnectedness per se. Right? Hmm. When you are separated from continuity, you have discontinuity, that's mm -hmm. the adversary. And then many different things, money, um, institutions, and other things play the role of increasing or furthering disconnected in our in our lives and in our social environment. Hmm. And Archangel Michael in the stories, right, is the is the egregore that represents precisely the capacity to combat, to successfully combat those demons, all demons, and restore continuity. But today you've proposed another one, or at least brought another one to the front. It's very powerful. Right? When you say music, you're saying something I, I can't even quite get my head around all of it because you're speaking about something like the conscious use of a particular relationship with all possible media of which music is the most pure uh, acoustic is the most pure and but brings our consciousness to the object of art which allows us to begin to notice that it shows up in all possible artifacts mm -hmm. that's a conscious use of an increasing awareness and attunement to objective art to produce hmm, a deeper and richer, so to produce an effortlessness in relationship with a deeper, richer hmm, moment, as you said. Mm -hmm. so there's something about that too. Now that's a, that's a serious egregore. Mm -hmm. That one actually has no name, does it? You're you're very. I just realized what you're what you're what you're describing. I have that scene of you at the at, uh -huh. the, at the wailing wall. But what about the wailing wall? I remember that story that you told me of the of your experience at the at the wailing wall, and I'm like, uh -huh. oh, that's who he's presencing in this experience. God. Hmm. Yeah, this is this is a, this is like the, the higher harmony. This is the harmony of the spheres in general. Mm -hmm. the actual. Hmm. Well, that's a really good egregore to have on your side. <laughs> Seems to be so far, you know, so far so good. And <laughs> I, I'm curious, though, and, and, and I don't know how long I want to go today, but probably about five more minutes, actually. So, yeah, talking. you know, I, I could also see see what you I, I, I see what you're saying. And I, I guess I could also see money and institution as a as a form of continuum of continuum as well though in in, in, a, in another way you know like one i would i would also say that that our assuming we're coming at the frame that humanity has getting has gotten better in the past ten thousand years which is which is my frame like i like i feel like you know yeah like it's that that we're that all things considered as much as much difficulties we're having you know for example if i was if I was to travel back in time and just inhabit a woman's body any time in the, in the history of, you know, the past, any time earlier than 70 years ago or so, or even 50 or even 20, I don't know if I'd want to do that. <laughs> you know, you know, so I, I, I think we could, you know, obviously uh, you could look at Pinker and all those guys who are pointing towards the better, but just uh, from the framework of, of humanity has gotten somewhere has evolved in various degrees. I, I would actually say that money, with all of its um, all of its peril, has also been a way for that to have happened. In that, it created a way to exchange energy and input that transcends the present moment in a way that I can develop something in this present moment and exchange it later, and it stores inputs in a way. Um, as as a it's a term of stored energy and exchange that as the complexity of society has moved into greater complexities obviously trade just doesn't work you know and maybe we can think of an idealistic way where we don't even need anything in return but if we look at all of of of, of the animal world and all that you know obviously it seems like self-preservation stays stays continuous no matter what well and, and trade trade happens too yeah so, so money as a way, in the ideal way, actually to to use our um, create a store of energy and um, gift to the system, in a way like okay, I, you know, I am bringing music and mindfulness. People exchange money for what I'm sharing. You know, my and I'm giving them something in return, and and it's mutual. 
that's a very good use of money. You know, or, you know, learning something that helps you better adapt and survive and feel better is a very good use of this thing. So I guess I also see it as a means of, of continuum in that um, it allows actions to, to be a little less time bound in a way, you know, like to, to uh, I, I, I can I can put in this energy for something, have this, even though right now it's all just ephemeral and, you know, digital, you know, whatever, but it's there, you know, at least in, in our functioning society as it is, those numbers <clears throat> exist somewhere and I can use them at a later point, which allows me to survive and eat. And, you know, like it, it actually seems to expand possibilities. And then, of course, the, the, the disconnection part is very easily to be found as well, you know? Um, you know, okay, so I was going to say something, but I think I can say something different. Um, so the first, the first is something like, I think it's TBD. This is, this is my resolution to the government, mm. that, that particular debate. Mm -hmm. Maybe, we don't know yet. It's a lot like pregnancy. Mm. The past story of humanity from the indigenous moment. And by the way, I'm not sure, if you were to go back to like a truly indigenous period, I don't, I, I would, I, I don't know what, what being in a female body would be like. Mm -hmm. People who come from a, an, a, an indigenous experience speak to the quality of life as being very high, like a lot of joy. Mm -hmm. uh, and this includes all the pains and, and what we might consider to be the uh, discomforts, right? Yeah. But in any event, the, that journey, you know, this long journey of culture, mm -hmm. um, from my point of view, is like pregnancy. Mm -hmm. We don't know yet. Right? It's going to be, it's a lot of pain, a lot of mess, a lot of blood, and it may actually be the end. I mean, I make it. Right? We, we still not, have not yet come to a place where we can truly have confidence that the power that we've produced is something we can actually navigate and manage as a species. Mm -hmm. so very easily self-extinguish. And, you know, like soon, like in a, in a time frame that, that matters to us. Um, well, time frame that matters to many people. Uh, you may have much uh -huh. longer time frame. <laughs> um, and also, ex the exact opposite, right? And also, we may find ourselves truly giving birth to something, which is, wow, holy cow, we, this is beautiful and expanding outward. And as you say, I, you know, this, this notion of money has a characteristic of disconnection and a characteristic of potential. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, and what I would say is it... it my, my experience is it really comes down to this very simple line and that there's on, on one half of the line is, is the unconscious or specifically in the formal language and form in forest language would be causality. Um, that which is not governed by choice. Mm -hmm. And the other side of the line is choice, uh, which is coming from, uh, well, it, it is, it is coming from choice and coming from a conscious, conscious choice. And humans are, in many ways, we are that, as you said, those two notes have a function. Mm -hmm. Humans have a function. Our function is choice. Mm -hmm. There may be other things that also have choice, but ours is, at, at the very least, choice. Mm -hmm. uh, more so than anything else. And so, to the degree to which we are expressing choice into the world, then we're heading into that sort of angelic direction. Yes. And to the degree to which our tools are expressions of our choice empowering to the degree to which our tools enslave us and make us no longer making choices but in fact simply expressing causation which mm -hmm. is what a prisoner's dilemma is right every game theoretic construct is nothing but the rational consequences of an algorithm which is no choice and right? so when we are becoming algorithm as opposed to choiceful agents that's the demonic direction and that's the way I've been sort of really feeling into that distinction. I think it actually ends up being pretty simple. You know, what's interesting is, is in, in the, the Jewish world, part of what separates angel from human is angels actually don't have choice. Right. They, they have to serve the higher. Yeah. It's, and demons so, don't either, right? What's that? And, and, and demons don't either. Well, you know, Judaism doesn't really look at demons too much. That, that, huh. that, that, that was the next group. <laughs> that, that kind of, of, what about demons, man? <laughs> what about I, angels to go the other direction? They got to be right. I, I think a part of Jewish wisdom in general, and there is some of the dark stuff, in, you know, in the mysticism, but it's no matter what, let's just focus on the good and let's see what happens. And, and if things are awful, can we find a joke? <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> and and, and which, fact, which, which levity will remind us of the presence of yeah yeah exactly we connect to that so it, you know anyway but you know the the choice of part of the the fallen angel was they wanted more choice they didn't want to have to serve they wanted they were jealous of humans that had choice so in a way you know a, a kabbalistic teaching is that we take our choice and we point it towards serving a higher good yeah Exactly. versus versus our own just personal i want this i want that i want that which you know but we can take the resources and choose to use it for uh, serving something greater yeah and i think that in many ways for me it's beginning to come out that it's as simple as that and if we are mm -hmm. making choices and choosing to serve a higher good then that way and if we are and, and by the way, I would say that when we are when we are not choosing to serve a higher good, what's actually happening is we are becoming more and more separated from our own choices. Yes, a hundred percent. Then that's that way. Yes. I suppose it's always been that, but in this particular moment, it's really super that. <laughs> it feels like so. Yeah. Yeah. All right, brother. Well, it's really nice to catch up with you. Yeah. Likewise. Yeah, it's always been a good good time to to connect. Are you still in LA? Yeah, I'm in LA in Silver Lake. In Silver Lake. Our next 